Emma Hutchison. It's nice to see you again. Likewise. It's been a, it's been a long time. So <clears throat> I remember when I first met you, it was at New York University in Manhattan. Oh, it was. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> I was doing technical pre-sales and, and you were the staunch customer. Yes, stakeholder. And, and we didn't get the deal and I felt terrible. And then we were ended up being colleagues. But I'd like to know, how did you get into technology and cloud computing in general? Well, it was I got into it by accident. I never thought I would be in technology. Um, I went to school for social and cultural analysis and thought I would go work at nonprofits and things like that. And then randomly, my senior year of college, I had a work study job and I, in at NYU where I went and the executive director of a nursing nonprofit, she just had heard about Salesforce and this was in 2009. So you can figure out how old I am. Uh, but I was like a work study student and just doing data entry in Salesforce. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. You know, wow, this is, look how easy this is. Look at these reports. And then I graduated and tried to get a job in nonprofit and it was, the tail end of the recession. So I don't think nonprofits were great at that point. And I went back and worked at that place full time, fell more in love with Salesforce, accidental admining, and kind of the rest is history. I worked somewhere else at NYU where I turned you down for a job, yes. but I led Salesforce there. And then a friend of mine and our former colleague greg yes uh was like oh you should come to aperio and i did All so no yeah. were, were you originally from new york or were you there just no i'm from yeah i'm from maryland outside of dc so okay. i came to new york and never left for some right. reason right 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 so um when you were learning uh, Salesforce, was, was, was that a big transition for you or or was it? Yeah, I th I've i always been, you know, people say that I'm a millennial, that we're all tech savvy, but I don't think that's true. But I've always been interested in technology and my dad was very interested in technology. He was a very, very early Apple adopter. Okay. We, weren't, we weren't allowed to have PCs in our house. Um, and so I always was like interested in technology. I don't think I realized that you could like do something with it. Right. So, you know, there's definitely some pieces that were harder, but I actually like the tech side, I think even more, like I don't have a CS computer science background, right. but I like making things work in that way. So right. wasn't go. that hard. So when, when you decided to go into consulting, mm -hmm. was it a uh, financial decision? Was it mm -hmm. a uh, adventure decision? Was it, what huh. was it? Well, I, so was it Greg was so persuasive. <laughs> <laughs> I think part of it was working in, higher ed at least at nyu they didn't have like salesforce specific roles so right my roles were always i was doing salesforce but doing other stuff as well right and i really liked salesforce and i didn't really want to do the other stuff and so <laughs> i had looked at like going other places you know like um like columbia has like a really big Salesforce sure. presence. And so they have roles that are like CRM roles. And I'd looked at stuff like that. But yeah, then I was like, huh, this is interesting. And I actually think a big piece of it of going to consulting, it's two pieces. One, my uncle is a lifelong consultant. Now he's uh -huh. not a consultant, but he 
um, now he works at Workday, but he was always oh, wow. like HR consulting. Yeah. So he was always like, you could be a consultant and like make a lot of money. And I was like, no, I couldn't. And then, <laughs> and then I think when I actually partnered with the firm that beat you out, I, uh -huh. it was a lot more work sharing. And so I, like really liked the consultant I was working with and we right. did stuff together and I was like oh I could do this and I enjoyed doing it as right. well um I had no idea what cons like I know what consulting was I knew what consulting was but I didn't really know right. what it entailed um but then I did it and then I tell people I probably learned I was at a Perio for almost two and a half years I think yeah I maybe made that up but something around that um and I learned more in those two and a half years than like the whatever eight years before because a you're doing it so much you're doing so much and b you are working with very very smart people and you get to learn a lot from them. Right. Um, so basically turning me down really changed your life. <laughs> I suspect you're not the only person on the planet that can say that. Well, <laughs> maybe, uh, professionally, maybe. Um, yeah. I think though that is not uncommon of people who work with consultants then realize they could do this like right. I think it's a big thing like I have my old college roommate she's worked in healthcare forever um she's a social worker so now she's like really high up in social work management and same sort of thing she's now consulting on the side for some healthcare tech group because right. she has this subject matter expert and she's like oh this is interesting you get to actually solve problems and there's less bureaucracy and so i think that's i see that becoming more common everyone's just going to tech yeah. consulting eventually everyone will work in tech but <laughs> it seems just to not to psychoanalyze but it seems like mm -hmm. your initial idea you, you were into social work maybe trying to change the world for a better place mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um nyu and then a period not that we don't change the world for a better place but the work is different right is mm -hmm. do you feel like you're still making an impact or is the impact different or how does that work well that's a great question i think i've been fortunate that i've worked predominantly in education mm -hmm. projects so you know, it's not community organizing or boots on the ground, but I think there's still a connection to helping folks have better processes and be able to focus on student success. I, I'm very, I'm still very passionate about, you know, like first gen or underrepresented yeah. communities and my day-to-day -day work isn't as necessarily like doing that but i know that the work that i'm doing still touches that and i think that's why we also work together for a bit on ivy tech yeah. and i think that's one of the reasons that was a really cool project because of the population they work with right. and what community colleges do yes so um that kind of brings me to my next ideas i want thing i want to talk to you is is about higher education in the mm -hmm. cloud and i came into higher education consulting very much from a just a, i was a student i graduated mm -hmm. right and then i was a consultant and then as i was got into higher ed i was just oh this is just one other industry Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, it's not. It was a lot. I went in with a lot of arrogance and came out quite humbled. Like this is a lot different than any any industry I worked in, and it's a lot harder in some ways. 
Um, many ways, many ways. So what is it about higher education and say Salesforce? Mm -hmm. What what makes it a tricky industry to work in? <laughs> uh, everything, no. I think, I think a big piece of higher education that makes it difficult is that you're not doing sales per se you are right like we talk about this a lot in yeah. you are trying to make a sale of come to our school but yeah. you're not trying to just sell people things that are or you shouldn't be maybe that right. they don't really need maybe right so i think there's this ethical moral side to it of yes we want to have higher admissions but we don't want people who aren't going to succeed to be like you know people sure. we want people to succeed we want people to get education we don't want to just sell them a you know cell phone or something yeah i i think it's higher ed also um was very early on a b2c model in salesforce that mm -hmm. salesforce didn't like truly embrace until later so right we have the higher the education data architecture which tries to manipulate salesforce into that b2c right. um but you know you see some higher ed doing traditional b2b like sales but it's mostly how we get the student in the door but also without doing shady techniques to get them into the door. Yeah. Um, and I've seen, I've worked with all types of universities and colleges, including for-profit, which my, I've been very lucky with for-profit to our good friend who I know has been friend of the podcast, Terry Traub, oh, yeah. helped change my opinion about of you know you still have shady institutions but just because it's for profit doesn't mean you don't want to give people education so i think sure i ramble a lot but i think that sales model of like yes you want to increase your numbers but you can't just sell to anyone and call it a day that makes it very difficult and then the other piece is just decision making in higher right. ed and higher education is very collaborative. Yes. Everyone needs to have an opinion, which could be great. It's academics, most leadership, especially at the school level have been faculty. Um, but that means that one person cannot just say, go do this or let's yeah. buy this. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, I think that's, yeah. That's a lot of what I've seen. You know, a lot of private sector companies will have one CIO mm -hmm. and they'll say, you know, okay, we're going to go with marketing cloud. Yeah. Boom, that's it. Right. I know. And it's you start implementing. And that's, <laughs> you know, it, that's not how it works. And the other thing is just, it's real tech, techie, but it's just the data, you know, oh. that the when i found out that the alumni data and the prospect data are two different pools that are never mm -hmm. touching i was like mm -hmm. there's no there's no equivalent in the private sector right customers right. who bought from us and customers who potentially will buy from us i was just Our like customers. Oh, yeah well yeah. customers right and it's just but it, it is it's frustrating and, it, and to me the rfp process wanted me to <clears throat> off myself a few times Right. Yeah, but that's, I think RFP can be the same in like government is even worse, but a lot of these schools are like, right. can be government funded. So state schools are really hard, but yes. I think that, and I think there's also, I haven't seen, I've done some work, just a little bit of corporate, um, yes. like at a period, I, I stopped doing education for like six months. Um, and I think there's also this, um, well, A, education in general is very um, 
they're not early adopters of cloud computing and the cloud. Sure. And I think there's also the structure of universities is super interesting because it's very, very siloed. And I know you have silos in, you know, pharmaceuticals, but yeah. you don't, I don't think have it the same way where you have your entire budgets that could never touch. And then we could have eight instances of Salesforce and not even know. And then IT not want to be involved because of who knows why. So, but I I think that the pandemic has pushed higher ed much faster than it right. would have been, right? Because right. they had to. Especially, I think, community colleges, which, which brings us to Ivy Tech, which is a very public story. So I think we can talk about it. Um, and I was on the inside from the at the beginning, kind mm -hmm. of proposing, and then you did the fruition of it. Mm -hmm. So again, our paths kind of crossed. Um, I don't know if you were cursing my name again. You know, it's always no. the guy who scopes versus the person who does it, right? No, but at least at a period, you could blame it on the essays and, and the the people doing the actual estimating. But yes. Yeah, I so was lucky enough to meet you in person on that before. So what did you do at Ivy Tech and, and what happened? What what did they do? Sure. Well, Ivy Tech is awesome. I think yeah. the team is great. Matt is yeah. great. Fantastic. Um, yeah. So Ivy Tech really had made a decision to go all in. And I think that's another thing that's hard with higher ed is that you, you know you have limited budget so you say we want to do this piece of the student life cycle so yeah. we want to do admissions or we want to do alumni but to your point then things get really muddy because you need data from other places so it, it expands but so ivy tech was kind of all in they want to overhaul everything if they could um and so it was a the big RFP out there. We won it. I feel like we had like the entire Perio nonprofit education practice on the project at one point. But the goal was to really revamp from, you know, it, not even admissions, pre-admissions. So marketing through alumni, bring it to Salesforce with what right. to the as much as they could. Um, and so we were really lucky to have the, also they saw the importance in strategy. So we had what, like a 20 week strategy, maybe 16 week strategy phase in the, in which enabled us to actually do road mapping and yeah. prep for that. Um, and then I mostly, when we were there, we focused on admissions, mm -hmm. the admissions process. Ivy Tech's interesting because there is no, uh, application fee and there is unless you have like something you know you've been banned you will most likely you'll be let in to take courses yeah. um so they're getting like or they just were getting 120,000 applications a year um for a month whatever's higher yeah let's say a month we'll they were getting a lot a day um, a day an hour <laughs> uh, and so it was cool too because their IT department was super involved and I think that's something you see in consulting is that folks sometimes don't realize how much work the business both right. the the business and the IT on the client side are going to have to do but they were like all in yeah so we revamped their application, combined their applications, did some integrations with um, Banner, their SIS, yeah. did Marketing Cloud. Um, so that was most of it I focused on. And then in the second phase, we did something really cool of um, their healthcare. Um, programs are the yeah. are competitive so those ones are actually 
uh, they actually have requirements and criteria, but we did a very, very cool way to do those selections, but then also make sure that the Ivy Tech wasn't losing students. So if you didn't get into the nursing yeah. program, you got rerouted to a CNA program or something that could still help you advance your career. So right. Amazing. Very, very cool. Yeah. I mean, I live in the neighboring state, Illinois, and how Indiana itself does higher education is really impressive. Mm -hmm. And I think how Ivy Tech, and you mentioned Matt, his vision and their idea for helping students is just really inspiring, you know, and, and I think community colleges more than any place is like on the ground and helping mm -hmm. people, you know, and yeah. uh, making sure they're they connected to connect to the economy, you know, and they, they have huge impact and um, higher ed has had a huge impact on me personally. I mean, I, I'm one of these first generation college students and went in just not knowing anything and I came out a different person. So it is, it's so, we talked about the challenges of higher ed, but it's so inspiring and oh. um, it's one of the, you know, most frustrating parts of our country, but one of the shining stars, I think, of our country is like our higher education. It's kind of an honor to be a part of it. Yeah. And I think a big thing, I kind of touched on it, is of getting into consulting. If you just see the breadth of higher ed right. in our country and, you know, um, I don't know if you know Clayton Christensen, who's yes. not alive anymore, but he had a whole thing that he thought in the next 20 years, half of higher education institutes would close. Right. Especially like the really, really small, you know, liberal arts colleges all over right. the country. And maybe that's true, but I've found it's just really interesting working with some of these places that I've you wouldn't even think of like right now i'm working on a project with a college that focuses on environmental sciences so like i'm doing work and there's like a course called like helping sea turtles or something mm. and did not think that existed but that makes complete sense and i think right. that it's nice to be a part of it because people are so committed and yes it's bureaucratic yeah. and there's lots of issues with it, but at the core, people just want education. And I come yes. from a long line of educators. So while I may okay. not be teaching, I can make sure a faculty member can think about teaching or research rather than, you know, right. keen in their ID number 80 times <laughs> or something. So. <laughs> that's true well uh i don't know if i'm breaking any hutchinson news a lot of people follow you but you, you're starting a new job soon i am can you tell us about it i am starting a job at a company called salesforce okay uh i will be <laughs> uh doing the it's interesting salesforce has for those of you who do or don't know um been more invested in professional services mm -hmm. in the past couple of years. So a lot of folks you and I know have moved over to Salesforce to do similar work, or they went to a consulting firm that was acquired by Salesforce. So yeah. I'm going to start at Salesforce as a senior solution architect. Okay. Uh, on the public sector team, which is a combination of government, nonprofit, and education. Yeah. But I believe I will be on education. Yeah. It's funny, they always put smush those three together, but if you know nonprofit, you don't, you could yeah. know parts of higher ed, but not yeah. necessarily in government. It's almost like customers difficult to work with. <laughs> difficult RFPs. <laughs> Challenging RFPs. Or really antiquated systems. Yeah. Because I think those all probably have that in common. And that's probably <laughs> because we don't invest in those areas. So they don't get any money. 
yeah. but that's not what this is about. But yes, I'll be there. Also interesting, I don't know if this is still the will still be the case, but so those all recently merged. And then not only do they have the, the three buckets, but at Salesforce, the K-12 and the higher ed are separate. So yeah. they have teams devoted to K-12, which is pretty similar. I've done pro projects with that, pretty similar to regular, but, or higher ed, but, you know, a whole different use cases and yeah so whatnot. you've done k-12 work uh not so i might i worked with a nonprofit yeah. that was using k through 12 k-12 but at my current firm we've done some pretty cool k-12 stuff so there's a couple you know more not selective k-12 schools but like small yeah. schools so they right. use k-12 but it's not you know new york public schools um gotcha. and then we did we've done some cool covid stuff with some uh bigger groups so cool covid stuff cool covid stuff you know we'll miss that someday remember when mm -hmm. we did the cool covid stuff i don't know um so you see the journey of emma right from someone you know, you're in an NYU, you start learning about Salesforce, and now you're actually there working for mm -hmm. them. So that's mm -hmm. quite a journey you've had. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think I'm very lucky to have met very yeah. smart people and stayed in touch with people. My, my wife makes fun of me because I say that my favorite um, social media is LinkedIn. Uh -huh. So I'm not like trolling people, but I, that's yeah. where I learn a lot about Salesforce too. But also you just meet people and you, whether it's on the client side or the consulting side, I yeah. think that's why consulting can be so helpful in your careers. Cause yeah. You know, well, would you say people. you're an extrovert or an introvert? Mm. I'm an ambivert. My gosh, I don't even know what that is. It's like ambidextrous. Yeah, it's a it's a combination. Nice. Um, I I say I'm an extroverted introvert. Okay, I so, might be similar. Yeah, I think I know I what like you mean. Talking to people, but I don't like small talk. Yeah, and definitely too much time with people. I need to like recharge, which is right. interesting that I do a lot of client facing work. <laughs> Right. I love um, like one on one and mm -hmm. maybe small groups, but like the amorphous like parties uh, mm -hmm. is absolutely draining. Yeah. If I have a topic, I'm very, I can do it. But yeah, I, yeah, my wife can talk to anyone and I just am like standing next to her very right. awkward. So it's like I have to. Yeah, come up with the next thing to say in my head so i think couples seem to form that way right mm -hmm. there's always one that's like hey at the party and there's the one left, and like i'm quite, i'm gonna go back to the uh, buffet table yeah oh, i love that or, or just i used to when i was much younger i i used to smoke cigarettes and don't smoke kids okay. all the children all the children listening to this yeah um but one of the reasons i liked it was a i could just always get out of a situation and be like gotta yes. go and b it helped me meet people because it was like a much smaller group right and at that point smoking was not cool or like not everyone didn't do it so you'd go right. out and there'd be like two people and you could talk to them right as opposed to a huge conference of a thousand people or something right but i don't smoke anymore so i've never smoked but ways. i've always kind of recognized that social aspect of it you know it it was more back in the 90s when i started working you know people would go out for a smoke break mm -hmm. and i always thought i wish i could go out for a smoke break but not smoke i mean i guess i could have but no because it's gross 
like now when I smell cigarettes, I'm just like, because okay. I still live in New York and people still smoke here, but right. definitely not. It's like Europe. Yeah. No, Europe is, I would say, okay. more more in Europe. Here, it's even in the past, I lived here almost 16 years. And yeah. in that time, like where you can <laughs> smoke, how many people smoke, just like it's much more of a no no. Yeah. One of my favorite authors, Spalding Gray, once said um, he lived in Manhattan because he wanted to live on an island between America and Europe. <laughs> I like that. Anyway, and uh, what do you do when you're not consulting and changing the world for positive and smoking? Uh, or I'm sorry, not smoking. Not smoking. Yeah. Uh, what do I do these days? I don't do a lot. I used to do more. Um, but I will say the one thing with consulting is, you know, time. Yeah. Uh, I think that's one nice thing about higher ed and maybe why it makes it hard is there are no real deadlines. Like, yes, yeah. we need to get this thing up by, you know, fall term and stuff like that, but not in the same way if we're going to lose millions of dollars if this thing doesn't happen. Right. Um, so consulting, I definitely work, but I like to read. Okay. Um, and I, one of the reasons I like living in New York is I like going to the theater. So mm -hmm. I like Broadway and that sort of stuff and doing that a lot. Yeah. And I used to have more hobbies, but I don't really yeah. anymore. Probably something like I have done volunteering um, and I had done a whole uh volunteering thing through salesforce actually not through, yeah. on on salesforce but timing just wasn't right and then i'm about to have a, a child so i think that will That's, probably change my yeah parenthood hobbies a, parenthood's a consuming yeah task i, I, I won't I, go into it but <laughs> i'm telling you there's nothing more rewarding and nothing more um, difficult. Yeah, I tried to to show you how cool and I am. I tried to make my wife use a Salesforce dev org to organize all of our uh, baby stuff. So things we needed, things we've gotten. Yeah, she was not into it, but yeah, it was pretty fun. Nice try, um, Emma. But yeah, but and I know someone else has done it for that. buying an apartment, things like that. Yeah. So, yeah, she just said I was a dork. I, I might agree, but you are wonderful, Emma, and it was <laughs> wonderful talking to you. And I, I wish you luck in your new job. Thank and you. Your new child. Thank you. And I don't know what else. Job and child, the, the bit, two of the biggest pretty, things pretty big, yeah. that can change someone. And, and you're doing them both at the same time. So you got to yeah. admire that. We'll see how that goes. Well, you might as well buy a house and I don't know. What what other major life changes can you do? Move, maybe move somewhere. like another Yeah, move to Kentucky state. or something. Okay. So, All right, Emma. <laughs> thank you so much for joining me. It was, you've been an inspiration. It was always great to be your colleague. And uh, Salesforce is lucky to have you. Thank you. Take care, Emma. Bye. Bye.